Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this another Lord's Day that Thou hast given us. One day out of seven, separated unto Thyself and Thy worship, and also that Thou hast sanctified it unto the good of Thy people. We pray that, that therefore, we would benefit this day from the fact that Thou hast separated this day for the benefit of Thy church. And we pray that Thy Holy Spirit would come and do what he is designed to do, and that is to lead us into all truth, to give us a comprehensive understanding of the gospel, of the scripture, so that we might not only be justified thereby, but also, and and in justif- being justified, uh, be delivered from the guilt of sin, but also, at one and the same time, be delivered from the power, the dominion of sin. Uh, that we would die more and more into sin and live more and more unto righteousness. We think of thy truth going out this day uh, throughout all the earth, and we pray that it would. We pray that thou wouldst raise up even more men to stand for the truth and against the lie. We see an awful, frightening apostasy, not only in our country, but this is a worldwide phenomenon, just as it was 500 years ago. And we pray to the God, of Luther and Calvin. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? We know that thou art the same God with the same omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. And we pray that therefore thou wouldst do a a wide-sweeping work among thy people once again. And that we pray for our government and the powers that be that we would be able to continue to proclaim the truth in peace. Now we pray that thou wilt be with us once again this day and enlighten us. Open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. We are continuing to look at verses 21 and 22 from Hebrews 11. By faith Jacob when he was a dying blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped Leaning upon the top of his staff, by faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. The past couple of weeks we have spent in, um, once again, reminding ourselves how we got from our original text, which is Isaiah 52, 7, Say unto Zion, thy God reigneth, how we got from that text to our present text, which is Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. We usually, about once every three or four months, we go back over and review how we got to where we are from where we were. Um, and But this time we've spent a little bit more time on it. I think mainly perhaps because we've seen recently so many more verses and passages which indicate uh, exactly why we are where we are in Hebrews 11 as it relates to Isaiah 52, 7, which is to say the verses which um, express the most important religious question. Verses such as Job 25, 4, How then can a man be just with God? Job 14, 4, Who then? Can bring a clean thing out of an unclean. Or Psalm 130, which says, If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, and he will, O Lord, who shall stand? 1 Samuel 6, 20. Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? Or Malachi 3. um, Behold, he shall come. Saith the Lord of hosts, the last book of the Old Testament, leading into the New Testament, justification, leading unto sanctification, a man's destitute condition, leading to his desire, Uh, the desire of all nations, you ever meditated on that? And the desire of all nations shall come. Well, he is only our desire insofar as we see our complete and utter depravity, which we're told. In the last book of the, which is just exactly where we expected to, 
where we would expect to see it. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? The same exact question. How then can a man be just with God? And last week we looked at a passage which perhaps more than any other passage explains how we got from Isaiah 52, 7 to Hebrews 11, which is Galatians 5, 6. Let's look at that once again. We're going to refer to that a couple, three times today. Hebrews, excuse me, Galatians 5, 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith, which worketh by love. Meditate on that verse. Memorize it. For in Christ, for in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. Circumcision meaning legalism. That was a problem uh, that the well, that was what the Judaizers wanted to foist onto the Galatians. Circumcision, oh yes, it's good to believe in Jesus, but you have to be circumcised to be a Christian. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, antinomianism, but faith, which worketh by love. Uh, we tend to think that God put us on this earth as a sort of a test. And if we pass the test, he's going to take us to a better place. Um, but that is to think carnally. Because we should think thusly. We should think that, but I go remember uh, John uh, 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. If you pass the test, he's going to take us to a better... No, no, no. no. That's to miss the fact of the type and the antitype. Our tendency. And, the, and fallen man, with, with respect to fallen man, it's not a tendency. It's his way of life. To take the type for the antitype. To grasp a hold of Schlitz philosophy. You only go around once in life. And so you have to grasp or grab for all the gusto you can. Uh, such is not the thinking of the Christian. And we see this world uh, as a world full of metaphors. We just talking yesterday uh, about um, um, the shorter catechism. That God created the earth. Uh, what are the decrees of God's eternal purpose according to the counsel of his will whereby for his own glory he has foreordained whatsoever comes. How does God execute his decrees? God executes his decrees in the works of, first of all, creation and providence. And since this world was created, you see, because uh, question seven comes before question eight. God had a plan. And then he created this earth to be the stage on which the drama of redemption takes place. And so it should not come as any surprise that this physical realm is chock full of metaphors for the spiritual realm, which we seek frequently to point out. And so, no, uh, this isn't... Um, God didn't place us on this earth as a test and then if we pass the test to bring us to a, a better place. No. We see the antitype through the type. Hebrews eleven sixteen. But now they desire a better country. Remember that. Just five verses before this, what we're dealing with today. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly at the time when we dealt with verse 16. We mentioned and we're going to mention it again. Now they desire a better country. This is not a difference in degree, but a difference in kind. They desire a better country that is in heavenly. You see, this, this earthly country is, is not our country. At the same time, it is a picture of our country. It's not like, oh, he's going to give us something else, something better. No, this is a picture 
of what he shall give us. The land of Canaan. See, you see, you see the metaphor? The land of Canaan was a pit. The land of Canaan was heaven in a sense. Because it was a picture of the spiritual Canaan. I think of back in Florida as much as I like to eat Publix fried chicken. You could say, well, you, uh, uh, if you think Publix fried chicken is good, just wait till you get to the heavenly banquet. The heavenly fried chicken. No, 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 no. It's completely wrong. Um, better is not better in the sense of degree, but it is to see the antitype through the type. Or we could say it this way. The difference between the picture of the banquet and actually being there. See, they're not two totally different things. It is, an, it is type and antitype. We see the antitype through the type. That's why we constantly mention these metaphors. And though this world with devils filled, here's the real temptation. It is it it uh, takes place in our real sanctification and our real salvation takes place in the arena of the mind. Though this world with devils filled, Luther said, should threaten to undo us, we will not fear. For God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. Some one uh, famous talk show host constantly refers to the arena of ideas. He's very close there. Of course, since he's a Natural man, he's as far as the east is from the west. But that concept, the arena of ideas. This stuff takes place, somebody I just saw online mentioned uh, something about mental health or mental illness. There is no such thing. There's such, such a thing as your, your brain uh, can uh, be ill, but the mind is a spiritual entity. So, and even in the New Testament, the demons, the demon possession was real. However, it once again, it was a metaphor. Do you see it? For the real demons that we're, that we're dealing with. And so God didn't put us on this earth to give us a test. Uh, and the passing of which would result in his taking us to a better place. You've got to, I mean, my background... That that's the only concept we had, which is totally wrong. Once again, second, remember 2 Corinthians 4.18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. You got it? It doesn't mean we don't look at these things, we look at something else. Complete, no, no, no. We look not at the things which are seen. We don't grasp a hold of these things. The Puritans used to say we, we use this world with a light grip. We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. We see the unseen through the seen. Because we're spiritual men. The natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of the only thing he has is the natural realm. What did we say before, remember? We can't say that the natural man doesn't have faith. He does have faith. The key is that his faith ties him to this world. What he believes ties him to this world. This is all he has. Uh, and so when we speak spiritual truth, we're speaking his language. We're speaking English. Uh, and so what does he naturally do? He tries to fit what we're saying into his natural... It doesn't fit. Square pegs don't go in round holes. Or you saw... You've seen this bumper sticker, haven't you? Fred is so heavenly minded that he's no earthly good. There's no such thing as being earthly good. You got it? Such and such a person is so heavenly minded that he's no earthly good. Think about this. How is, how is being earth, how is it possible to be earthly good since you're only here for 80 years. Which goes by about as fast as 80 days. Or the song, perhaps the glow of love may grow with every passing day. Or we may 
never meet again. But then it's not for me to say. Perhaps the glow of love may grow with every passing day. So what? Oh, and the, with the pre prevalence of divorce. But look at the marriages that succeed. Well, is it possible that they only succeed because they're so su superficial they can't see that they can't succeed? This world means absolutely nothing, only in so far. What is marriage? What is marriage? A picture of Christ. That it's nothing else. It's nothing else. It means absolutely nothing apart from the antitype. It's a type of spiritual truth. And Christian, you, which is to say, I said all that to say this. You, I'm not making this up. You are in heaven right now. You see that? On this earth, since this earth is so chock full of heavenly metaphors, this is heaven in a sense. You are in heaven. But as 2 Corinthians, we see through a glass darkly. Did you ever notice it doesn't say we don't see perfectly clearly. It says we see through a glass darkly. That's how far we are from where we shall be, but we're already there. Got that? Let's say that again. We see through a glass darkly. It explains to us just how far we are from where we shall be Whereas at the same time, we are there. You want another statement of it? Christ's healing of the blind man in two stages. Remember that? I think there was only one instance in the New Testament. Christ healed quite a few blind men, didn't he? But there was only one instance, as far as I remember, of a twofold healing of a blind man. He first of all healed him and he said, I see men as trees walking. Do you see it? He saw that the difference between what he was then and what he was before was the difference in kind. He saw nothing before. We see men as trees walking. Um, so, <laughs> or I thought of another, I thought of another uh, example of this. Perhaps the best Twilight Zone uh, episode was where this robber uh, robbed a jewelry store and he was running from the police and they shot him and he died and he woke up in a place where he was given everything he wanted and he, had, he even had a servant to make sure he had everything he wanted. And at one point he said to his servant, Oh, what, for a second, I thought I was in the other place. To which his servant replied, This is the other place! Now, by the same token, on the other hand, This is the other place! I'm looking forward to when I get there. This is the other place! Ephesians 2, I'm not making this up. Ephesians 2, 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's where we are now. This is the other place. Philippians 3.20 For our conversation Conversation here means manner of life. Our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our conversation here is in heaven. And back to Galatians 5, 6. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith, which worketh by love. This is perhaps the best verse to... Take us in our minds from Isaiah 52, 7 to Hebrews 11. But faith which worketh by love. Say unto Zion, thy God reigneth. 
God reigns by His law. By causing us faith. He gives us faith. Faith in what? Faith to love His law. Faith which worketh by love. The love of what? The love of God's law. Neither circumcision nor neither circumcision which is legalism nor uncircumcision which is antinomianism but faith with which worketh by love. Circumcision representing legalism the legalist fails to see the law, the law of God. The antinomian. See, the legalist fails to see the law of God because he substitutes, he substitutes his own laws that he can keep for the law of God. The antinomian, he doesn't see the law of God because he never, uh, he never loves See, the fact that the legalist changes his own laws for the love, that means he doesn't love. Why would, he change, why would you exchange your laws for the law of God? If you love the law, you wouldn't. On the other hand, the antinomian, he uh, claims to come face to face with his guilt, but the only way that you can see yourself to be guilty is to be given a love for the law, which condemns you. You can't be condemned unless you admit the standard which condemns you and love the standard. And so we see the importance of Galatians 5, 6 and taking us from Isaiah 52, 7 to Hebrews 11. Faith causes us to love the law. And last week we dealt with Joseph and I hope we're beginning to see a pattern Abel, Hebrews 11, beginning with the first part of the chapter. Abel is not Enoch, is not Noah, is not Abraham, is not Sarah, is not Isaac, is not Jacob. But we see a pattern in every single one of these people. It's meant for us to see that because it's there. And so why does God go to such painstaking lengths to teach us these things? For example, Abel um, is a picture of justification, but sanctification is not mentioned in Abel. Uh, Enoch is a picture of sanctification, but which is to say we don't see Enoch readily, not at first glance, in Abel, and we don't see Abel in Enoch. I hope we're beginning to ask ourselves questions as we go through this chapter because the Christian life takes a lot of concentration. We said at the time, able to be justified and enough, enough to be sanctified. You see it? You need to be able to, we need to be able to see Enoch in Abel and to see Abel in Enoch. Say unto Zion, thy God reigneth. And so God's law, God's ruling by his law, caused Abel to see. God's causing Abel to love the law, brought Abel to complete and utter despair. Because Abel saw that in Adam, he fell under the guilt of sin. And in coming face to face with the law, he saw his need being under the guilt of sin for deliverance and Christ's propitiation. That was the essence of his sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, a sacrifice of propitiation. And then on the other hand, God's law caused Enoch to see that in Adam, he had fallen under the dominion of not only the guilt of sin, not only the objective guilt of sin, but he had fallen under the subjective dominion of sin. And so God, in ruling by his law, caused Enoch, just as he's caused, he caused Abel to love the law, which brought about his total despair of himself, because in loving the law, he sees that God demands something of him of which he has nothing. 
And then with respect to Enoch, he saw that in Adam he had fallen under the subjective condition of the dominion of sin. And, in, and God causing him to love the law brought about his reconciliation, subjectively speaking, to the law of God, to obedience. And so in Abel, and we don't see our justification, we do see our justification, but we don't see our justification and then say, okay, I'm justified, but I don't need to keep the law anymore. Christ is my justification, so I don't need to be sanctified. That's antinomianism. In fact, um, if you say, if you're an antinomian, that's why they oppose it so much. If you say you're, if you, if you think, if you even think that you have an inkling of holiness, then that means you deny Christ because Christ is my holiness. So, antinomianism seems to understand justification, but they don't because they haven't been caused to love the law of God. What I'm trying to say here is, is, is that in, in the person of Abel and in the person of Enoch, these two concepts, justification and sanctification, for the sake of understanding, for the sake of dis making a distinction between the two, they can be separated. But in an absolute sense, justification and sanctification cannot be separated. Or in a practical sense. In other words... It is not that Christ is my justification, but I also need to be sanctified. You can't separate the two. It's sort of like, here's another metaphor, Siamese twins. Justification, sanctification. Suppose these two Siamese twins had only shared the same heart. You separate the two Chinese twins at your and at their peril. So it is with justification and sanctification. They can be separated for the sake of argument, for the sake of making a distinction between the two. Objectively speaking, we are justified. We're just as perfect as we ever shall be. Subjectively speaking, we're far from perfection. Justification is, a, is punctiliar. It's a one-time one act. It's an objective phenomenon. Sanctification is progressive. We die more and more to sin, live more and more to righteousness. Justification. Um, we've mentioned this before. The false concept of justification. The, ant the legalistic concept is faith plus works. See justification plus sanctification. Faith plus works equals justification. That's legalism. Faith equals justification minus works. That's antinomianism. Oh yeah, I come face to face with the law of God and I see that my need for justification, but okay, now that I'm justified, hey, Christ is my justification. They say, the antinomians, they always, for some reason, they bring up the Sabbath. Do you keep the Sabbath? Are you a Christian? Of course you do. Christ is my... Sabbath keeping, the antinomians say, well, Christ is your thou shalt not kill keeping too, right? Sanctification. Uh, so, uh, so legalism, faith plus works equals justification. Antinomianism, faith equals justification minus works. The biblical position, faith equals justification plus works. Justification cannot be separated from sanctification. So, um, once again, what answers the problem of the uniting of justification and sanctification? Once again, Galatians 5, 6. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor, circum nor uncircumcision, but faith, which worketh by love. It works by love and justification. Driving you to total despair. You love the law of God, so you despair of yourself. 
You cannot despair of yourself if you don't love the law of God. And in sanctification, faith worketh by love. God causes us to love his law, and in so doing, we are subjectively reconciled to his law. And think about this. Both men in the lordship controversy, which took place in the 90s, they had a similar problem. They had different, they had different problems, but when, it, when all is said and done, they basically had the same problem. They sought to separate justification from sanctification. The first guy says, um, sanctification is being a Christian. Salvation is receiving Jesus. Now, it would be a good idea to obey him, but you don't have to obey Jesus to be a Christian. In other words, what he was saying was, sanctification is being, so I don't have to do. The second guy comes along and refutes the first guy, and he says, no, it's not enough to go in for justification. You also have to go in for sanctification. So what is he saying? Salvation is doing, so I don't have to be. There it is. The solution is Galatians 5, 6. So to look at Ana, excuse me, to look at Abel. Looking at Abel, we see Enoch. And looking at Enoch, we see Abel. Here's another interesting thing. From time to time, I'll give you examples from the Chinese language. Because the Chinese language is a creation of God. If you know a Chinese person who's in medical school and you ask him, what are you in medical school for? And his answer will be, because I want to be a doctor. But in the Chinese language, to be a doctor, literally, to say, I want to be a doctor, is to say literally, I want to do a doctor. You see it? You can't be a doctor without doing a doctor. Justification and sanctification. In that language. Colossians 2.6. Let's look at this one today. Did we mention that yesterday? I think we did. Uh, Colossians 2.6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. That's the gospel right there. As ye have therefore received. Here's salvation. This is what happened when you guys said you received Christ, Jesus, the Lord. Christ, meaning the anointed prophet, priest, the three offices in the Old Testament which required anointing with oil or the office of prophet, the office of priest, and the office of king. Yeah, we did talk about this yesterday. Because... And this is another instance of the, ma the amazing nature of Scripture. Christ is, Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the anointed prophet, priest, and king of his people. And yet, the prophetic office, for the most part, refers to the Father. Christ executes the office of prophet in re revealing to us by his word and spirit. God's law. So the prophetic office refers to the Father. The priestly office refers to Christ himself. So Christ in being our prophet refers us to the work of the Father. Christ in being our priest refers us to Christ himself in procuring the salvation the Father has determined. And then Christ being the king of his people refers to the work of the Spirit. As ye have therefore received Christ, the anointed prophet, priest, and king. Before we get to that, the last part of the verse, I want to mention something else that I've thought about. Haven't you thought about this? I'm sure you have. Isaiah 9, 6, one of those Christmas verses. Um, and his name shall be called. Have you seen that chart or his name, the names of Christ in about... Well, how many of them? 25, 30 of them. And his name shall be called. And this one's right in the middle. Wonderful. Counselor. 
the mighty God, the everlasting Father. How could Christ be called the mighty God and, and the everlasting Father? I'll tell you how. It's found in how we got from Isaiah 52, 7 to Hebrews 11. The mighty God coming face to face with the law. God's giving you a love for his law and in that love for the law bringing to you the total despair of yourself because the law condemns you but it only condemns you in so much as God has caused you to love it. In Christ. Uh, his name shall be called Wonderful Counsel, the mighty God. In Christ being the mighty God executing the office of a prophet. He causes us to see that he is the everlasting father and reconciling us to himself by giving us a love for his law. As a sinner, as an unregenerate man, your relationship to God is judged to criminal. But in Christ, that relationship has changed from judge to criminal to father to son. That's how we see it. Mighty God is Christ and everlasting father. And everlasting father, because he's the mighty God, he will use his omnipotence to destroy you apart from Christ in whom he becomes the everlasting father. So as ye have received Christ, prophet, priest, and king, Jesus the Lord refers to his authorization for being the prophet, priest, and king of his people. How can he be prophet, priest, and king? Because he is the God-man, Jesus the Lord. So, therefore, Colossians 2, 6, walk ye in him. What did we just say the principle of sanctification was? Was it last week? Be what you are. And there it is once again. So, Colossians 2, 6, once again, is a summary of the gospel. Then we have another verse. Verse after verse. After what is the gospel? This is it. Saying to Zion, thy God reigneth. Isaiah 45, 21. <clears throat> Tell ye and bring them near, yea. Let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Hath not I the Lord and there is no God else beside me? A just God and a Savior. There it is. You see it? The gospel. Once you see God as a just God, once you come face to face with the law of God, you ask the question, how then can a man be just with God? Because I have nothing of that which he requires of me. And then you see, he is also a savior. Justice of God. The abstract of theology. <laughs> you heard that before? Why do these people talk about the abstract of theology? It makes sense. I was, uh, in fact, here's how much sense it makes. I told this story again too, but not quite in the same from this same um, standpoint. Visited a church in Taiwan and discovered that the pastor wasn't preaching that day, but it was the president of the only remaining evangelical seminary. The president of the seminary was going to be preaching the message. He preached on John 1, 12, but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believed on his name. And the Chinese says it this way, but as many, I think it's clearer, but as many as received him, which is to say those who believe on his name. So this is the way he started his message. He said, you might have been in this church for 25 years. You might even be an elder or a deacon in this church. I want to ask you this day, have you received Jesus? And then he said, 
Believe on his name. He said, we're not going to talk about that. I just want to know, have you received Jesus? That's too abstract, he said. There it is. He condemned himself with his own words. You first of all, he's a just God. The abstract of theology. How can Christ be transcendent and at one and the same time transcendent and imminent? He transcends us from creator to creature, but that's not the most important aspect of his transcendence. The most important aspect is found in Isaiah 59 too. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear you. Remember back in the 80s when that president of the Southern Baptist Convention nobody would, who would listen to the president of the Southern Baptist Convention today? But they, they listened to him then in the political realm. When he said, God does not hear the prayer of a Jew. Remember that? Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. He won't hear the prayer of anybody. That's what drives you to total despair. He will damn you for your prayers. Howling on their... What does is, what is the Old Testament refer... Uh, how does the Old Testament describe a sinner's prayer? Howling on your bed. So... A just God and a Savior. That's what people mean by when they say, have you heard this a hundred times or a thousand times? Christianity isn't a religion, but a relationship. The same thing. Christianity isn't, Christianity is caught, not taught. There you go, same thing. Well, James 1 says, not only does James 1 say Christianity is a... James 1 equates Christianity with religion. The reason we don't like religion is we don't like doctrine. We had that reformed pastor get up and say the object of our faith is Christ, not doctrine about Christ. The only thing you can believe about Christ or about anything or anybody is doctrine. Doctrine simply means teaching. So, notice another thing carefully about Isaiah 55, 21. It doesn't say a just God, but a sa he's a just God. But don't forget, he's a savior too. No, he says, it says a just God and a savior. Which is not to say, as the, as the, Legalists in that lordship controversy said, you must receive Jesus as Savior, but you, but you also must receive him as Lord. No, he's a just God and a Savior. Justification drives us to sanctification. There is no absolute separation of the two. Love for the law drives us objectively to justification. And love for the law drives us subjectively to sanctification. Drives us, drives us objectively to sanctification by causing us to realize that in Adam we fell under the guilt of sin. Love for the law drives us to Subjective sanctification by causing us to see that in Adam we fell under the dominion of sin. Yesterday, we talked about, well, we, we got to question, isn't this stuff wonderful? You never get away from it. You can't get away. It brings you right back to it. We talked about question 39 in the shorter catechism. And where did it take us back? Take us, took us right back to question three. Chief in a man, chief in a, was a chief in a man? That's the first question. Man, chief in is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. What rules God given to direct us? Second question. How to enjoy, glorify and enjoy him? The, question three. Uh, the word of God which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament is the only rule to direct us. How we may glorify and enjoy him. Now question three. What do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach. 
what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. That's the same, that's justification, what man is to believe concerning God. That's the first table of the law driving you to total despair. And what duty can, can we prove that? But when we get to question 39, we prove it. What is man's duty? Uh, uh, scripture's principle, we see what, uh, man, what man is, God requires of man and what, duty, what uh, man is uh, requirement with respect to God and what duty God requires of man. And we get right back to it in question 39. And here's why. What's the next question? What is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. His being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Every one of those attributes condemns you. And then he talks about sin. And then he talks, did God leave all mankind to perish in the estate of sin and misery? God's the Father's uh, work and salvation. That's question 20. Question 21 to 28. God the Son's work, the Redeemer. Christ as Redeemer. Begin with question 29. How are we made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ, the Spirit? All the way up to question 39. Where we get right back to uh, Scriptures principally teach what man is believed concerning God and what duty God requires of man. And so that's sanctification. So faith, working by love. We see Enoch and Abel, and we see Abel and Enoch. And today we're going to have a new verse even. But first last week, we talked about Lazarus. Here's another picture of the same thing. You can't see anything in Scripture until you see, unless and until you see what we're talking about, right? It, it permeates every single aspect of Scripture. Old Testament, New Testament. You see it? Same idea. Lazarus, come forth. The voice of the law in justification, causing us to realize our guilt. And then what does he say? The same voice of the law, loose him and let him go. The voice of the law in sanctification. God's ruling by his law. And we are tied, even as Christians, as Lazarus was coming out of the tomb, the difference between what he was then and what he was before is a difference in kind. And yet, Christ says, loose him and let him go. That's our sanctification. And today's the verse, today, the verse we're going to look at today is found in Mark 9.24. Mark 9, 24. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Lord, I believe refers to justification. Help thou mine unbelief refers to sanctification. Sanctification is the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die in sin and live in righteousness. Help thou mine unbelief. I believe. And then everything else after you're justified, we need God to help us. We walk by faith. You see it? I believe justification. Objective salvation. Help thou. My unbelief. I believe you're just as perfect as you ever shall be because Christ's perfect righteousness is imputed to you. Help thou my unbelief. But your faith grows, does it not? You see more and more, just like that man. I see trees as walking, and then he could see clearly. That's a metaphor for glorification. See men as trees walking. That's the beginning of your Christian life. 
Look back at when you first became, and some of you haven't been a Christian very long, but you can still see this. How little you understood then as compared with how much more you understand now and yet how much more you need to understand. You see men as trees walking at first, but you see. I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Notice he said, the father of the child cried out with tears. Help thou mine unbelief. And crying out means what? Crying out for help? Crying out to memorize the Westminster Shorter Catechism? I, I, I must admit, I am more than a little bit disappointed with some of you. We're not going over the Westminster Shorter Catechism just to go over the Westminster Shorter Catechism. We're going over it first and foremost for you to memorize it. Word perfect. Help thou mine unbelief. Once you see the glorious nature of this document, how can you not memorize these questions and answers? It is nothing short of phenomenal. The help that we derive from it So, I believe, what did we see yesterday, remember? I think we talked about that for the first time, didn't we? We're talking about the image of God, which consists in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. Knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. That's the gospel. We are renewed. Amen. For you to say that fallen man retains the image of God is, you're pretty close to being a reprobate. In fact, the, the Christian leaders, I refer to the Christian leaders who insist on fallen man's retaining the image of, they're reprobate. You look in the scripture and you can, it says you can tell some men are reprobate. I assert that they are. See, salvation is being renewed in the image of God. Because God gives you understanding. God created man, male and female, after his own image. In knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. The first thing is knowledge. Who of God has made unto us. First Corinthians, see all this, see how this, everything fits together. Everything fits together. First Corinthians 1.30. Who have God has made unto us. Wisdom. Referring to knowledge. And righteousness. And sanctification. You see it? Knowledge. Righteousness and holiness. Wisdom. Righteousness. And sanctification. Same exact thing. That's the gospel. You believing subjectively in your total complete and utter depravity. And... Objectively, you believe in Christ. You believe subjectively something about yourself. Well, that's what we mean by subjectively here. In, 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 in saving faith, in justifying faith, you believe something about yourself and you believe something about Christ. You believe yourself to be completely and utterly depraved and you believe in Christ's perfect righteousness as your only hope to stand before an infinitely holy God. So that's, Mark 9, 24. Lord, I believe. I believe in my complete and utter wickedness. That every imagination of the thought of my heart is only evil continually. Imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born speaking lies. So, the father says, I believe. And then he says, Help thou mine unbelief. That's sanctification. And then lastly, back to our text in Hebrews 11, verses 21 and 22. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning upon the top of his staff. Notice carefully, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the next in the line of the Messiah was not Joseph, but was Judah. This is significant. It has to be significant. Bless both the sons of Joseph. Joseph's sons, not Judah. Verse 22, by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing 
of the children, plural, of Israel. This has to be dealing with the covenant, God's covenant with his people, that God saves his people in the line of continued generations. And let me say something else. That if you are a young person and have a wife, you must be consumed with the idea of the covenant. You must. Rachel said, give me children or I die. You must be consumed with this idea. God saves his people in the line of continued generations. If you're single and young and don't have the gift of celibacy, you must be consumed with this. You have to find, God has a wife for you. The doctrine of the covenant. And I want you to see just how prevalent this is in Scripture. Whenever I get an inkling of this, see, in preaching, you preach the text of Scripture, obviously. And usually you preach the main idea in whatever text you're dealing with. At the same time, you can preach a subsidiary idea idea in the text, which is what we're dealing with now. Why would you preach a subsidiary idea in the text? And here's why. Because of the importance of that in the age in which you live, in your own particular context, which is what we're dealing with now. Notice that. Oh, they got a new law in New York now, right? You can kill a child just before he comes out of the womb. Well, from a certain standpoint, most of those children are not the children of Bible-believing, church-going Christians. Am I communicating? People getting all been out of shape about that. Are you been out of shape about this? That shouldn't bother us in the least if we understand the doctrine of the covenant. See, we're going to multiply and overcome our enemies through sheer numbers. Do I know when it's going to happen? No. Do I know that it's going? Yes, I know that it's going to happen. Because that's the way God always deals with his church. Genesis 1.28 and God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply to Adam and Eve after he created them. Genesis 9, 1. After the flood. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Hey, have you ever noticed this? Has it, has it rung home to you? Has it sunk down into your thinking processes? God speaking to Noah and his family. God was speaking to the church. It was a church on the ark. Be fruitful and multiply. Six verses later. Six verses later. He says it again. And you be ye fruitful and multiply. This is talking about physical multiplication. Remember that idiot we referred to who was the founder of that parachurch organization. His vision of multiplication. You lead two people to Jesus and each one of those two people each lead two people to Jesus and then each one of those each lead two people to vision of multiplication, he said. He called it. That's not God's vision. That's a baptistic vision of multiplication. How can, and let me ask you a question. How can you lead one? This, this girl, girl missionary, confronted me and said, Hey, Winnet, since you're talking so much about doctrine, how many people have you led to Jesus in the last five years? I said, Brenda, can you tell me how I can lead one person to Jesus? It's easier. It's easier to lead a cockroach to Jesus than a depraved sinner. 
That's how confused we are. The church. That's God's vision of multiplication. Six verses later, and you be ye fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. He says it twice. He says it in Genesis 9, 1. He says it in Genesis 9, 7. And in Genesis 9, 7, he says it twice. He says to Abraham, Genesis 17, 2, and I will make my covenant between me and thee and I will multiply thee. No, 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 he doesn't say that. He says, I will multiply thee exceedingly. Genesis twenty two seventeen. 17. God says to Abraham, after he refuses, to, after he, he keeps him from sacrificing Isaac, that in blessing, I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply my seed as the stars of heaven. He says to Isaac in Genesis 26, 4. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. Genesis 26, 24. Let me say this before I forget because unless I say it now, I will forget. Basically, the only word you can no longer say on the, on, on, on the airwaves is the F-bomb. Hey, am I the only person who knows why? Because it is a holy act. That's why. Because of the doctrine of the covenant. He says to Isaac, and the Lord appeared unto him. The same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed. Isaac says to Jacob, God Almighty, bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee. God says to Jacob in Genesis 39, 35, 11, And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. He commands, this is a command, again and again and again. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. Jacob says to Joseph, in the context of Hebrews eleven twenty one, 21, which is what we're dealing with. Jacob says to Joseph, and said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make thee of thee a great multitude of people, and give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. Moses says to God, reminding God, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed. He's reminding God. God says to Israel in Leviticus 26, 9, for I will have respect unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you. Deuteronomy 7, 13. The relationship between love and multiplication. Listen to this one. Deuteronomy 7, 13. And he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. If God loves you, he multiplies you. Deuteronomy 8, 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply. And go in and possess the land. Possess the land. Hold on, wait, wait, hold on, hold on a second. Are we spiritual people? How do we possess the land? Through multiplication. Deuteronomy 13, 17. And there shall cleave not of the cursed thing to thine hand, that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show thee mercy and have compassion upon thee. And God shows his people mercy by multiplying them. Deuteronomy 28, 63. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply. To do you good. God doesn't do you good unless he multiplies you. Deuteronomy 35. 
And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good. And Once again, he only does thee good by multiplying thee. Deuteronomy 30, 16. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, and his statutes, and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. You're not living unless you multiply. Jeremiah 30, 19. You haven't heard this before. You haven't heard anything before, have you? And out of them shall proceed thanksgiving and the voice of them that make merry. And I will multiply them. God will multiply his people. The greatest desire, I mean, we can't even under, this is how stupid we are. The greatest, the most powerful desire that God gives to a man is a desire for children. Jeremiah 33, 22. We're not surprised that the, that the world perverts this desire, calling calling uh, uh, two men getting together marriage. We're not surprised, are we? Jeremiah 33, 22. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither is the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David, my servant. See, hey, and we're not surprised that Baptists don't multiply, are we? You shouldn't be. Since they believe in individualistic salvation, they've got to... They got that, that other vision of multiplication. We're not surprised at them. I looked online to see if I could see any difference between the, the Baptists and the Presbyterians with regard to physical multiplication. None whatsoever. I went to a church that the, perhaps the major reformed leader in the entire world was the pastor. Never spoke of multiplication. Ezekiel 36.10 And I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel. Ezekiel 36.11 And I will multiply upon you man and beast. Ezekiel 37.26 But moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them. And then Hebrews in the New Testament. He is the writer of Hebrews is repeating God's promise to Abraham. Hebrews 6.14 saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee. Isn't that even a blessing? Why, why does he say it that way? Blessing, I will bless thee. And multiplying, I will multiply thee. He's equating the blessing of God with physical multiplication because God saves his people in the line of continued generations. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this another time together. We thank thee for thy gospel. We thank thee that upon this rock, the rock of the Confession of Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not. The gates of hell are prevailing against thy church as we speak. But the gates of hell shall not ultimately prevail because thou art a God. That multiplies. What an opportunity we have. When the reprobate are killing their children. As far along as one day before they come out of the womb. That in multiplying, I will multiply thee. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.